actually <laughs> make all that rumbling noise. Um, so we'll, we'll let uh, John get this fixed up and then uh, we'll have him bring up the song. We've got a couple songs to sing. Um, what we'll do is we'll, then he's going to have our prayer in just a minute and we'll start with that and then we'll have a couple songs and um, do communion and then um, do a lesson and then wrap it up, I guess. We have a we always got to wait on the tech. <laughs> we can go ahead and start. We're streaming. I'm just making sure everybody that's watching the video is fine. Before we did this before, it was sideways, oh. so people couldn't turn it. So I just ask it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So some people, were, yeah, you gotta turn your head. Yeah, wonder what my neck hurts. I'm not getting any comments. We got five viewers right now, so we're good to start. All right. We'll get that. We'll get the songs ready, and um, let me know when they're ready, and then we can have Danny start with our prayer here. All right, let's, uh, I tell you what, let's stand up and we'll have Denny have our prayer and then we can begin with a couple songs and do that. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us to be in your house today to worship you and praise you. We pray that you give us peace today and bring us a message and may the Holy Spirit speak through him to us, Father. Be with those that are on the prayer list, be with those who are sick, and be with those who have lost loved ones, Father, just give them peace and comfort. Amen. We most of all thank you. We have a joy to the world is the first one. And, and I won't be leading singing. I'm just I'm gonna stand here and look at the words. Because I don't listen, I don't even I don't even sing in my, my shower because it's not so I don't insult you. <laughs> So you always got to wait on the tech guy. What's that? You want to use the info? All right. That's fine. We can do that. What's the number? I don't think. Do you still need the info? 88. Oh, here we go. We're going to get it going. I can't sing anyway and, and without a uh, fixed pipe or anything. Hmm. So let's do this. Um, let's do verses one. I gotta get my glasses. <laughs> I tell you, that's bad news, isn't it? All right, let's see. How about if we do verses uh, one, two, and four? Let's do one, two, and four. All right. I need your help. Joy to the world, the Lord is come.
his love. All right. So we have the next one. Supposed to be a good year. Do we have it, John? Or no? Let's see if it works. Not working? Okay. All right. Well, let's see then. What's the name of it? Let's do this. Um, we can make it up as we go. Um, trying to see what else. Uh, let's do uh, 83. Because I don't, I don't have that on the list for any of the times coming up the next couple of weeks. So let's do number 83 or Come All You Faithful. And let's do um, all three verses uh, of this. And then after that, uh, John is going to have communion. Uh, and then Gil will have our prayer for that. Okay, 83. Oh, come on, be faithful, joyful and resurrection 
He conquered death, hell, the grave, and so the gift continues, giving us eternity. Christmas present, remember the Lord's steps. The communion, the word communion is an action word which means fellowship, have in common. At the Lord's table, we might uh, we call to mind the highest cost of our salvation. While it was free to us, it cost Christ every his every body and life's blood. Above all, he is present when we as he let me back up here. Above all, he is present with us always and represents here and now at this table. Christmas future. Remember his soon coming. First Corinthians eleven twenty six. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. When we partake in the Lord's Supper, we are remembered the promise of his return. As we think of the three tens of Christmas, past, present, and future, let us be sure to remember that our past is forgiven and forgotten, that our present gift of life cannot be purchased, rather has been purchased, and that the future is written except for the end. Take the clean slate and walk in his steps until he comes. As we take <coughs> the Lord's Supper, let us give thanks for the stable where it all started, for the sinless life, and for the blood, body and blood sacrifice. Jim? Let each one of us examine ourselves, examine our heart, repent of the sins we may have committed, ask God to forgive us of those as we prepare for the taking of these elements. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the love that you have for each one of us. You sent Christ here as a babe to be born of a virgin, to live a life without sin, and to ultimately die for each one of us that have forgiveness of sin. As we partake of these elements, the love which represents his body, and partake of the cup which represents his blood, we thank you, Father, for these elements. We ask that you forgive us of our sins. We also ask that you spiritually strengthen us that we may endure the trials we face in our daily lives. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> I want you to think about something while I got to turn this on. There we go. Now can you hear me? Is that on? That's on. Okay. Anyway, I said to uh, Georgine, I said, um, what do you think I should talk about? And here's the thing. When she answered me, I knew this is she was thinking, this is what I need. Because when I said, well, what do you think I should talk about? She said, without the, no second thoughts, patience. <laughs> I said, now, here's the thing. I definitely need patience, and I need a lot of other fruits of the spirit. But I said, I don't have time for that. <laughs> anyway, in this month's uh, Christian Standard Lookout, the, the, the title of the whole uh, thing in your articles pertain to Peace on Earth and Troubled Times. The uh, one article is called Our Powerful Eternal Prince of Peace, and the writer starts this way. I love Hallmark Christmas movies. I can imagine that this year, Hallmark, Hallmark might air a very COVID Christmas. And I thought, you know, here's the thing. If, and he goes on to describe what the movie would be like. If you've, if you've seen a Hallmark movie, you can tell me what that movie's going to be about, because they're all the same. Anyway, I thought of another movie. Do you remember the movie 
gets a wonderful life? Well, that's what I thought of. And here I was living in Bedford Falls, and I went to bed one night, and I woke up the next day, and I'm in Potterton. That's kind of the way everything went. I mean, I just woke up one day, and everything has changed. Everything is different. Everything is going downhill, it seems. And I thought, well, you know, this is not good. But on top of all of that, I knew that I was really in big trouble. I knew I was really in big trouble. When I went to, I went to Walmart, I went to Sam's Club, I went to Kroger's, and I couldn't find a toilet paper one. I couldn't even, listen, Amazon didn't even have it online. I mean, it was completely sold out. But you know, the phenomenon is, it wasn't just in the United States, you know, that was a worldwide thing, that they were running out of toilet paper everywhere in the world. I thought, how crazy is that? So I said, well, there's only, there's only one, we got it done. There's only one thing to blame. There's only one person to blame. <clears throat> and I'm hoping we've got the video. I'm a forbidden fruit, and not to brag or nothing, but I'm pretty much the most amazing apple ever. And a girl. because I think those are the best commercials, and that guy is hysterical. But here's the thing. I don't know if Allstate really believes that at one point that there was mayhem began. Well, you notice at the end he says, mayhem always has been, always will be. At one point there really wasn't mayhem. At one point there really wasn't a, a virus. At one point there was really paradise. And unfortunately, uh, there was a guy called Satan which we know is the devil that came along and did some things that affected all of us for, for all our lives as we live here. Now, we'll get the slides up here in a second and I uh, want to go on with that. Now, I've, I've coined this the idea of 2020 is the year of the virus because, you know, the virus is such that when you say the virus, you know what you're talking about. If you say Elvis, you know what you're talking about. If I say Dolly, you know who I'm talking about. So it's just the virus. It's this year of the virus. It seems like it's been forever, but it's only been this year that this virus has seemed to have controlled everything. And I'm not making light of it, but here was the thing. And again, going back to when we didn't have any toilet paper, you know, we thought, or we were told that possibly over two million people would die in this country from this virus. That's pretty serious. Now, when you think about it, I understand why everyone would be concerned and why things happen as they did. Well, anyway, I, I don't know about you, but I went through a lot of ups and downs in my emotions and, and doing different things and, um, and, and, and thought about, you know, why is this happening? Well, there were some articles, not so much recently, but back in March and April, that um, a lot of them were. Well, God is bringing a plague on the world. There were articles that, no, this is Satan who brought this plague on this world. And, that, you know, as Christians, we've got to pray because the idea was that God was going to kill all the ungodly people and that Satan was going to wipe out the church. So anyway, it was one of those things that I thought, you know, it's interesting that we always have it. Anytime we have anything like this, and if you remember back again, thinking that maybe too many people would die, it's automatically the end times. 
Everybody, everybody, I mean, there's a thing that says, well, this has got to be the end times. This has got to be it, based on uh, what we know in Revelation. So, anyway, I, th I think it's one of those things that when we look at it, um, is it more so the opportunity that we have, that, that, that's here, that if, if we give Satan, if we give the devil credit for everything that's ever happened bad in the world, mayhem, I think we're giving, I think we're giving too much blame or too much credit. And at the same time, if, if we say that uh, God is the, is, the, is the problem, then here's the thing, or, or if we say that God did this, then I think it takes away from us the element of, if you will, independence and the ability to make choices. Because if God's controlling everything, then we have no choice from the standpoint of controlling every little thing in everybody's lives. And there are people that do believe that. Anyway, I want to look at a familiar scripture, which um, I know you know. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. And over the next few weeks, I want some, some Bible lessons uh, about some of these things pertaining to this and, and kind of bring it all together, I hope. Anyway, it's from the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. In, in verse 10, he says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, and with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. You know, as I was thinking about this, and again, it's one of those things that I was really kind of thinking, you know what? I gotta get more, much more serious about my spiritual life. And one of the things that, that I thought seriously about is, you know what? Here's the thing. We, we, we hear about warfare, spiritual warfare, and we hear about fighting the good fight, and we hear that Satan is alive, one about prowling, trying to devour us, but again, I, I wasn't taking that seriously enough. I wasn't taking it personally enough. I wasn't trying to incorporate that in my life. But here's the thing. The circumstances, which is what we live in, the year of the virus, that's a circumstance. Those circumstances are always going to change. What was True yesterday is not going to be true today and probably won't be true tomorrow from the standpoint of our circumstances. But the, the most serious thing, and I think the, the thing that's eternal, if you will, or help us to get to eternity, is the reality of the spiritual fight that we're in. And that's, and that's really what Paul is trying to tell us here, is that we are in for a spiritual fight. So when we think about it, we say, well, it talks about the evil one and the devil. So who is this evil one and the devil? Well, of course, you go back and you think, well, this was Lucifer, who was an angel, who rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven onto the earth. And mayhem began with the temptation. So when we look at some of these things, I need to get the right pointer here. There we go. We look at it and we think, well, Satan has all power. No. God, God is God is the creator. Satan is like us. In other words, angels are created beings. They, they have no more power than God has whatsoever. Now, the angels and the cast down angels, demons, have more power than we do 
because they're spiritual beings, and that's really reality. We're just living in the temporary. They're living in the eternal. God is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere all the time and, and, and always has been. I can't explain it. That's all I know. The, what, what the Bible tells us is that's who he is. Always there. Satan is not everywhere. Satan has to travel around. Now, where does he live? I don't know. But somewhere in the realm, that spiritual realm, he lives. God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. He can do anything. Satan has limited power. Now, here's the thing. Satan has more power than we do within ourselves, but not outside of God. In other words, with, with God, we can stand, as Paul tells us in Ephesians, withstand the devil. That's what, that's what we have to do. Our mission means that God knows all our thoughts all the time, regardless, every one of us. How he does that, I don't know. He's eternal. He's, he's, I mean, you can't put a qualifier on it. I don't know. Satan does not know everything. Satan, I think, is like this. Now, here's a guy who's had 5,000 plus years experience. The Jewish calendar, this is year 50, 80, 50, 81. So here's Satan when he was cast out. Him, he was down on earth. We know about the temptation with Adam and Eve. He's been fighting a battle for over 5,000 years. That's a lot of experience. Now, with that, you figure he's probably got a pretty good-sized bag of tricks. Things that we don't. In other words, if you're married or, or you know, with your, with your mom or your dad or with your any loved one or somebody you know, you know that you can push buttons. I know Sarah can push match buttons. Now, she didn't know that. She had to learn that. Okay? But she learned it and she uses it. So guess what? Satan knows what he can use on me. He knows what he can use on you. He knows what he can use on you. And it's all different. Why? Because we're all different. So he's going to use different things at different times. That's kind of the way it is. But that's where we are, in, in, if you will, in the struggle. Now, what I wanted to do, i got to find my right paper here. Is to think about it, you know, here's part of the issue. We're in a battle, but really it's, we're, we're, it's invisible to us. But, but it is reality. So here's our enemy. We can't see him, we can't touch him, we can't smell him. But he's there. Here's the other thing. In the midst of this battle, in this war, we can't hear that cannon, we can't, we can't smell that gunpowder, we can't, there, none of our senses are any good because it's in a different realm. It's in that spiritual realm, but it's reality. Just like where we are now is reality to us. Now here's the thing, so it says that we, we put that armor on, so how is, how is Satan going to attack us? Well, you think about it. Yeah, you think about it. That's how he's going to attack us. It's, it's, it's really a psychological warfare for us, if you will. If you, can, if you can control the mind, you can control the will, you can control somebody's emotions. That's how he attacks us. Now, when, you, when, we, when we go on with that, so it's the idea that we can't hear them, but they really speak loud and clear, don't they? Because remember, what he's going to use on me, he's going to use something different on you. Because he knows you. <laughs> Doesn't know all about you, but he knows what to use against you. And that's what he's going to do. And it's really about the idea of things. So who are we fighting? Well, it talks about some of these things and, and, and the words that are found in the Greek are these words, lords of ru rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, and spiritual forces. Now, the thing I find interesting is this, and there are a couple different theories, is that number one, it's just, remember, it's not just not Satan. It said that when, when the devil was kicked out, 
Satan, the serpent, the dragon, a number of other names that are used, the evil one, when he was kicked out of heaven, he took one third of the angels with him. Now, how many that is, I don't know. We don't have a number. But it's a, I imagine it's a pretty massive army. So, you know, this is a guy that's got a lot of influence. If he could take one third of what was present in, in, in heaven worshiping God, he took one third of them. He's got a pretty powerful army. Now, this idea of, of these different things is either like a, if you will, a chain, a chain of command, where you have a command staff at the very beginning, that would be the rulers at the top. Then you have those that are under them, and those that are under them, and those that are under them. That's one theory, and that's one idea. The other idea is maybe each one of these are assigned to a different part of the world. You've heard of the four, cor four corners of the earth? Maybe that's the idea. Each one of them has a territory, you know? So within that territory, that they operate within that territory. I don't know. Again, some things in the Bible we don't know what's true and what isn't, but we do know that these are the spiritual forces, and that's and that's what there's, there's four different words. So the assumption is there's at least four different types, or at least four different groups, or maybe four different locations. I don't know. But when Paul says, therefore, we need to take up the whole armor of God. By saying therefore, the whole idea is because of that. In other words, this, these are the enemies. Because these are the enemies, we have to do this. Now, I'm not going to talk about the armor of God today. We're going to talk about that over the next few weeks. We're going to intertwine some things. But here are some actions that are required. First of all, let me get my paper. He talks about Fastening up the belt of truth. So the idea of fastening up is a girdle. Now, I never worn a girdle, except I did wear a football girdle. They called it a girdle in football, remember? You put that thing on, it was really tight, and held your pads, your hip pads, and your, your tailbone pad. So you had that girdle on, and that, and that kind of kept everything in place, you know? It held you up there. So that, that's, where you, that's where you got the, uh, the, the strength. So it's the idea of being dressed in readiness. In other words, you were, you, were, you were starting to get ready to go out for whatever you were doing, to fight the battle. So the next thing he talks about is putting on the, the breastplate of righteousness. Well, the idea of putting on is the idea of sinking into a garment. Again, it's form-fitting. Fits perfect, like a glove. The idea of being like a glove fits perfect. It's nice. It's nice. Where it fits right on you, it's not too tight, it's not too loose, but you have to have it that way to fight the battle. Now, the idea of taking up, in other words, you, you take up the whole armor of God, the idea of taking up is, you're not just picking it up, because I can pick anything up with no purpose. I can pick this up, I pick it up to a nice and light and wouldn't break. Um, so I can do this is, if I broke it, then I would owe somebody some money. I can break this up, but I can pick this up, but I have no intent to do anything with it. It's no, no use. The idea here is when I pick it up, I take it up. There is an intent to use it. It's for a purpose. It's just not picking it up, but it's, it's, it's picking it up to have an intent for use. Then the idea of withstanding is the idea of holding one's ground, keeping one's possessions or position. So it's the idea that you're not going to get knocked down. Now, I said it before, if you try it alone, it's not going to work. You have to be, really, spiritual power only comes from God. That's the only way that we can stand. Otherwise, we're not, we're not going to be able to do it without it. So, the thing of it is, we say, well, it's a spiritual battle. We can't see the enemy. We can't smell them. We don't hear them. And, and again, we don't see the results in that battlefield. But man, we see the results in this in this place we live in. I mean, we see the bad things that go on in this world. That is, and that is a result of that spiritual influence on this world. That's what it is. The idea of the fall of man, that's, that's where all that badness comes from. So we do see a result of what happens. 
So we can say, yeah, there is something that really does, we can't see the battle going on, but we know that there are bad things that, that, that do happen. The next thing he talks about, or one of the things he talks about is the struggle. Well, literally that struggle is better, better the idea of a wrestling match. It's a wrestle bout. Now, Mark's not here today, but Mark was a great wrestler. And I think a great coach of wrestling. But the idea being is, you know what? You can't get any, you can't get up any more any personal than being in a wrestling match. If you've never wrestled, that is as close as you you are going to get to anybody that you may not even know. And I'm going to tell you, it's it's to the takedown. That's the whole point. It's to the takedown. You know, because Satan doesn't just want to cast doubt. He doesn't just want to divide. He wants to destroy us. And he wants to destroy every human being out there. That Those are his enemies. Here's the thing to remember. Satan doesn't care if you worship him or not. He just doesn't want you to worship God. So if you don't worship God, you don't believe in God, he's already won. It doesn't matter if you worship him or not. <laughs> the schemes that, that's used here, this word, you recognize that word? What does that word look like to you? Methods. Methods. Methods, it's plural. It's deceitful plans. In other words, yep, he's got some methods. Now, again, I don't know what they are necessarily, but what he's going to use on you is different from what he's going to use on me. But he's got methods. So what those methods are, that's what we have to be aware of and what we have to fight against. Because we may not know what they are, but we know that we've got to fight against them. So now in 2 Corinthians 10, Paul also writes a little bit about the same subject. And it says, For we walk in the flesh. We are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Get this idea? We're an active soldier. You're always, and this, this idea of weapons is always in the plural. It's multiple weapons that we have. We have prayer. We have resistance to the devil. That's a weapon. That's a spiritual weapon. We also have the word that we have. That is a weapon. Those are things that we have to, 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 to help defeat. The idea here also that it's, it's divine power, the word for God, theos, is the word that's used for there. So it's God power. Literally, this is God dynamite. That's, that's exactly what the phrase is. Now, it, under, it underlines the idea that God always has all the resources we need to prevail in every form of spiritual warfare. Now, that's good to know because whether we like it or not, and whether we want to be engaged or not, it's an everyday thing. 24-7, Satan and his demons do not quit. So for us, whether we believe it or not, it's going on and it's happening all the time. Just like, do you remember back in 2001 when the Twin Towers were hit? One of the comments that was made, and I don't know who it was, but they said, Islam has been at war with us for 20 years, but we haven't been at war with them. Satan has been at war with us our whole lives, but we necessarily haven't been at war with him. But that's what we need to be doing. And again, that's what I think. Some of this thing that happened, maybe, if you will, helped you think about that. If not, I want you to do this this week. Read Ephesians. Read the book of Job, because Job tells you how the devil can attack you. It's, it's a great read. And it, over a few days, you can get it done. But read it. Study it. Learn about, and I'm not saying you have to do a deep dive, but learn a little bit about, about who we're fighting. Learn about who, who our enemy is. Now, we come to the church. We've talked about the idea of individual, if you will, the individual attack that we have as, as individuals, how we withstand 
some of those things. And again, over the next few weeks, we'll talk a little bit more in some, in a, uh, some different ways. But what about the church? Well, one of the things that, that I want you to think about is this. This is a book that was written a couple years ago. It's called Dark Agenda, The War to Destroy Christian America. And David Horowitz, I don't know if you know who he is or not, he's not a Christian, he's a Jew. He was raised by communist parents, but later in life became, became much smarter and went away from communism. But anyway, his idea is that it's, this is not, what he talks about is not spiritual, but he's talking about how through legislation, through laws, through other persecutions, it, the church is going to be attacked. Now, it's interesting that he used that phrase, the war, because that's what it is. We know it's a spiritual war, but Satan not only attacks us as individuals, by attacking the church, he can attack it in two ways, from within and from without. From within, we know that's through division, through conflicts, through whatever it is that, that people won't forgive one another, people won't love one another, if people won't try to understand one another, if for whatever reason, from within, or leadership that can, can displace it, that's one way. The other way is that it's attacked from the outside. That's through persecution. Now, whether it's, whether it's hardcore persecution or just the insults that one gets, that's another thing. But what he talks about here is he says, now, why would we, why would we think that that's from Satan? Well, that's a person. Well, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 8 says this. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. The idea of hostile being set in the flesh, being hostile to God, means hate. Those that are set in the flesh hate God. That's through Satan. That's through the original sin. The idea of the fall. Man's mind is not God's mind. Ephesians 2, beginning with verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in, in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You notice that? It says that the ones that walk, that we walk that way once as following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. So, you see the connection? There is a spirit that controls them or gets them to think that way. Now, is that demon possession? No. I'm not saying it's demon possession. But it's certainly what influences the mind. So whenever you have someone like Bill Maher, you know who Bill Maher is? Bill Maher is on HBO, he has a show. Evidently he did a movie back about oh, 2008, it said, he did a, a movie called uh, Rig uh, Religiosity. And the idea was he went around and he wanted to make people of faith look really stupid. And he went to Vatican City and he went to, um, Salt Lake City, where uh, the Mormon uh, center is, and he also went to Jerusalem. So it didn't matter about the faith, it just mattered if it was religion. But again, the idea was to make people look stupid. But here's the funny part, you said, well, how did he get these interviews? Well, he lied to them. He said, oh, I'm making a movie called A Spiritual Journey. So here again, that's the mind of man. He had to lie, couldn't even be truthful about what he was doing. So you see the whole idea is that what Bill Maher says is this. 
Religion must die in order for mankind to live. Now, you think about that. Now, Bill Barr doesn't have any influence on me whatsoever, but he has influence on some people. So that's one of those things. Now, the other thing is the idea of persecution in Russia under Karl Marx, and I don't know if you knew this or not, but inspired by the hate of revolutionaries, uh, they regarded religion as the enemy of progress and the mask of oppression. In Russia, Marx's disciples removed religious teaching from the schools, outlawed criticism of atheists and agnostics, and burned 100,000 churches. When priests demanded freedom of religion, they were sentenced to death. Between 1917 and 1935, 130,000 Russian Orthodox priests were arrested, 95,000 of whom were executed by firing squad. So the idea is that, yes, we have a, a spiritual battle, but that spirit can influence the physical. And, and that's what we as the church also have to recognize, that it's just not that spiritual battle, also can be, if you will, a physical one. Now, real quick, Ben Alexander was a, I don't even know if he's still living, but he was born in England, and through circumstances, he was a, an orphan, so he went from home to home to home, and he became a spiritualist. And he started getting deeper and deeper and deeper into, into the spirituality aspect of it until finally he broke away and he was he became a Christian. He now is in the United States and he has a ministry called Exposing Satan's Power. And through it, he talks about, you know what, the things that we think are subtle are truly Satan's, if you will, innocent chess game that we think. But he's but he's very serious. The idea of the Ouija board, the idea of the magic that's seen in Harry Potter movies and books. The idea of seances, Dungeon and Dragons. He says, no, those are really gateways. Those are gateways to the spiritual world. And not the good spiritual world. So it all goes back to, if you will, that idea of a mindset. And that's really what we have to, to think about. I want to close with this, this verse that I have up here in 1 Peter 5. It said, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that in the proper time he may exalt you, casting all of your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. That's a message to the church. The idea is be humble and be alert, be sober-minded, and by our faith, we have to stand. That whole idea of humility reminds me, or I think about, in Second Chronicles, and I know you know this verse, it says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, turn from their wicked ways, and pray, then will I hear from heaven. Three points. We have to be humble, humility first. I, I think that's one of the things that really, for me, happened, is that, you know, when things seem out of control, <laughs> you've lost control, what do you do? The second thing is, we really have to repent and really think about where we are in the world and the circumstances where we are now. And then, of course, with prayer, I think God then will hear our prayers. Can you we have our closing prayer. Do we have a song up, John? Um, we can sing it, but I don't have the. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, um, we'll find a song to sing here.
But I want to say, uh, Jim, you're going to have our closing prayer. Um, this is the last thing that I, that I want you to think about. As a church, in a spiritual battle, is this. Satan's desire is to destroy every person that's on this earth. He and his demons, that's their mission. But the reason for the church to exist is so that we can win those souls. That's our calling, and that's our mission. That's our purpose. We have to fight that spiritual battle. Guess what? The war's already won. The, the end is known. At the end, it says that Satan's going to be cast into the lake of fire with all his demons. That's done. But the, the issue is we have to fight the battle now and here. And that's really what it's about, is being able to fight that, that battle every day that we have. And that's Jim to close us with a prayer. And um, let me see. I don't know what would be a good closing song here. How about Silent Nights on 87. What is it? Silent Nights on 87. Um, let's do Silent Night next week. Okay. Can we do that? Remind me. Let's do let's do twenty three. It's joyful, joyful, we adore thee. That's kind of a praise song. I think that's what we need to, to end on. So Jim, if you will. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time you you've given us to be here today to study your word. Father, we know that we each need to be spiritually strengthened that we may endure the trials we face in our daily lives and that we may be victorious over sin. But Father, we also know that we're weak. We uh, cannot do it without your guidance. And we know that you've given us the Holy Spirit to be with us and that we can just rely on him and on you and your word that you've given us through the Bible that we can be victorious over sin. So we ask that you be with each one of us, continue to guide and direct us and strengthen us that uh, we may go forth from here and spread the good news of Jesus Christ to those around us. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let's try it here. <coughs> joyful, joyful, we adore thee, the God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts of full of flies before thee, hail thee. Yeah.